my name is Joe Willie. I'm a research engineer at Underwriters Laboratories. And today I'll be talking about a project that I've been working on that involves using Dash to create an inter interactive app uh, for firefighters to interact with sensor data while they're testing one of their pieces of equipment. Uh, so like I said, I'm with UL. For those of you who aren't familiar with UL, they're a, uh, a safety certification company, pretty large organization, over 12,000 employees in 46 different countries. Um, there's actually two sides to UL. There's a for-profit side, which is where most of the employees work, and a non-for-profit side. And I have the pleasure to work on the non-for-profit side, which is about 100 employees strong. And uh, the group I work for is out of Columbia, Maryland. They're called the Firefighter Safety Research Institute. And basically, our mission is to conduct research that's focused on advancing knowledge about fire behavior throughout the fire service and as our group continues to grow and expand throughout fields that are adjacent to the fire service. And UL is, uh, I've really enjoyed my time at UL. It's been tremendous, a tremendous company to work for. The culture there is very mission oriented and focused on creating a safer world. And uh, working for the group that I do specifically, the company is very supportive of the research we do. Uh, and in uh, layman's terms, the, myself and the other engineers in our group, our job is to light things on fire and then <laughs> watch what happens, measure what happens, and then talk about it. So it's a pretty fun job. And <laughs> in terms of a programming background, I have what I would consider a casual programming background. And by this, I mean that I've uh, taken some courses, or I took some courses as an undergrad that involved uh, learning C and C++. And, I've worked with LabVIEW a bit and other uh, languages. No, it's all good. <laughs> anyway, uh, but by and far the programming language I'm most familiar with is Python, and that's the one I use most often. It's actually what the language that uh, most engineers in our group use. And typically we just do your kind of standard data applications with Python. Uh, packages I've become familiar with over the years include NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and uh, usually, like I said, it's for data analysis, and we use it to generate plots and figures for reports and presentations uh, that we give. That's kind of a simple plot. Uh, it's basically a common plot that we make, but any time that I have the opportunity to, to get a project at work or outside of work that involves expanding my knowledge of Python, I'm very excited to jump on the opportunity. For example, I just finished up a project that involved using uh, OpenCV and TensorFlow to detect uh, flame height in uh, video fire tests we did and then extract flame height data from the video for us to analyze. So this is kind of how I got involved in this project I'll be talking about today is uh, I found an opportunity to learn a new set of Python skills and I decided to jump on it. So I'll start by talking about a little bit of the background and motivation for the project. Then I'll give an overview of exactly what Dash is and why it can be such a powerful tool. And then I'll uh, get into details about the dashboard that I've made and I'll demo it in its current state. And then I'll finish with some key takeaways about uh, the whole process so far. So I got involved with this through my work uh, one of my coworkers one day was talking to me. His name's Keith, and he was saying that there was this firefighter in, in uh, Washington, D.C. who was on a rescue squad. His name's Kelly. And just an aside for people who aren't familiar with uh, fire service terms in the room, a rescue squad is a, a crew of firefighters who are also proficient in technical rescue skills. So if somebody's trapped in an elevator shaft or uh, they crash their car and get in an accident and uh, become trapped, the people who are responding to that incident are more, more likely than not going to be uh, rescue squad members. So they do a lot of stuff with uh, ropes and rope rescue. And so Kelly was telling Keith that there was this uh, device that he's been using known as the Arizona Vortex. And it's designed to keep ropes off the ground, which prevents them from being damaged. It's especially useful when you're doing a rope rescue on uh, jagged rock or other rough surfaces. But it's a 
tool that needs trial and error before it's implemented because there's different configurations that you're able to set up. And if you don't know exactly where the forces are going uh, in, the, in the device, it can topple over and uh, cause the rescue to become catastrophic. So this is just an example of some of the different configurations. Uh, you can see here on the left is one with all three legs. And then the middle one, there's only two legs there. And they even have a configuration where you only use one pole. And so Kelly and other people who have used this device started asking where are the forces on the legs when we're using these? How different are they across configurations? And do we ever approach the rated limits of the legs? And Kelly took the initiative having no sort of background in electronics or computer programming to, uh, he bought a couple load cells and bought a data acquisition device and did a little machine work and he was able to uh, mount the load cell in line with each leg and he was through uh, learning the system he was able to collect data and then like happens a lot in research you collect the data and then you just have more questions <laughs> so that's where uh, he was asking Keith if Keith knew anyone who might be interested in working on this project so when Keith told me about it I immediately jumped on the opportunity and I had previously uh, known about Dash but I've never used it and I thought this would be a perfect opportunity to, opportunity to learn the tool and uh, use it. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Dash allows you to create interactive uh, web-based applications that are, can get extremely data rich and uh, they become very powerful tools. So I'll uh, show you some actual interactive ones in a slide or two but this is just a screenshot of one. But basically, um, all of this is interactive. You have drop-down menus that will uh, determine, will affect this plot here. You can go to the map and get data from different counties simply by dragging and highlighting areas. You can, uh, there's sliders that you can do. So a lot of different tools. And if you were to do this from the bottom up, you would have to know JavaScript have to know probably some CSS. If you want to host it on a server, you have to set up your own server. All skills that I don't have. <laughs> and uh, so I've never even really dreamed about doing anything like this until I heard about Dash. And that's where Dash comes in. It's a library from Plotly. It allows you to make dashboards like that all through Python. So it's written on top of Flask, Plotly.js, and React.js. And I'll show you some, there's a, a, a page on the Dash website, it's the Dash app gallery, and there's a, I don't know where my mouse is, there we go. Um, and they have 43 different examples of different dashboards. And so I have one pulled up here. Uh, it's about, it shows the New York oil and gas production over the years. So. There's a uh, slider where you can filter for the different dates. There's radio buttons that you can, uh, you can select to have all the fields, so total production. Or you can do a drop down menu and look at specific kinds of production. And it'll update this, this plot accordingly. There's also uh, an example on the Dash app gallery of live plotting, so this is uh, grabbing data from a database and updating it. The data's wind speed, and you can, again, uh, vary certain parameters of uh, the dashboard, and it up updates accordingly. And the coding, uh, the code structure for Dash is uh, pretty simple and straightforward, as I'll get to in a, in a minute or two. So it's an extremely powerful tool, especially for uh, researchers who really only know Python you are able to uh, create data visualizations that uh, allow you to find, or allow you to have the potential to find certain relationships between uh, certain parameters that you might not find if you were just using standard uh, Python data analysis tools. And also it gives you an opportunity to visualize your data for 
end users who may not necessarily have the technical expertise that you do, and they can still interact with it and see how things vary. So once I set up uh, a meeting with Kelly, I decided I might as well learn a little bit of Dash so I don't come in completely in the dark. And Kelly passed along a couple uh, data files to me, and so I figured I'd write up a couple uh, dashboards, very simple examples, to show him, to give him an idea of what the capabilities of this, this tool is. And I'll, I'll use one of the examples here to show you just how simple the structure is of uh, dash code. So this, this is uh, one of the two that I made uh, for our initial meeting. And basically, it selects from a dropdown, and it has all of the data files that he uh, provided to me listed there. And if you select any of them, it, it creates uh, two graphs, one with the voltage data and then one with the converted voltage to uh, the load. And you can switch to different files. So it's a very simple example. If you look at it, there's basically three parts. There's your, your text up here, there's your drop down, and then there's your graphs. And so this is the code uh, for that uh, dash object. Basically, there's two parts to a, a dash code. One is your, your setup and your layout. And so, like I was saying, there's three components. There's the HTML, uh, the text at the top, and then there's the drop down. And there's a whole uh, a bunch of core components provided by Dash that include uh, interfaces like the drop-down sliders, text inputs, et cetera, that are easily defined. And then um, there's the output graph here. And then the second part of your Dash code is how, does, how do the components up here in your layout uh, relate to one another? So the first uh, input in your callback function or your callback decorator is what's going to get updated from the function that follows. And then the second input is uh, what, uh, what dictates this uh, function to run. <laughs> and so I have here that when the value of the file dropdown uh, changes, it'll run this uh, function below, which is it just reads in the data frame of whatever file was selected and then it outputs uh, the two two graphs. So it's very simple and very straightforward, which was uh, very nice for me to see. So when I met with Kelly initially, we started going over uh, what exactly the project was. He showed me what he's done and basically started talking about what he would like. And we started bouncing ideas off each other. And eventually we got to what the goals of the project were, <clears throat> what the purpose was, and different ways we could fulfill it. I demoed a couple of the examples for him, like the one I just showed you, and another one that showed data uh, being plotted in real time. And I tried to uh, describe the capabilities that were offered by Dash. And I've shared the app gallery with him, so the ideas have started to flow now, and I'm very excited for the future of this, of this project. Um, but eventually, at the end of the meeting, we had a list of initial objectives just to get this thing off the ground and running. And so here's the, the list. Uh, our goal is to read data into a file and then output the values in real time and be able to generate plots after the test was completed, and all with this being an interface that's very easy to understand and straightforward to use. So this uh, first version, I focused on functionality over aesthetics and uh, I guess neatness of code, you could say. Uh, and I tried to keep things fairly simple. For example, I continued to use the uh, data acquisition device that Kelly had originally purchased. 
I was thinking of switching over to Arduino controllers because I'm more familiar with those, but I did some research and of course there was a Python package out there for this product. So the support was, was pretty good and I hit the ground running, so that was nice. But as I started to dive deeper into Dash and look into things and start coding, uh, the ideas started flowing and I, it became a little difficult to focus just on the functionality. So I found it was very useful to just jot down uh, the ideas that I was having and any questions that I had for Kelly, but basically come back to that f for right now, focus on the, the end product being functional and then we can worry about bigger and better things. And so I have a uh, demo of what the dashboard looks like so far. Um, so I made three tabs. There's a setup tab that has a bunch of different inputs that can be edited by the user. Then there's a real-time plotting tab, which will populate with a graph as uh, data is transmitted. And then there's a post-test plot, which uh, after the fact, after running a test, if you still want to look at your data, you can select from the drop-down your data file and it will appear there. Um, so this drop-down is, it has all the channel options that are on the device and whenever you select one uh, under enter de desired channel names, a text input box comes up and you can input whatever you would like to call that channel. Uh, just so you don't have to remember OAIN4 is the, f the load cell on the left. So we'll be, I'll just be using uh, one load cell today. I can just input uh, SB load cell. And then there's a list of additional inputs like the data type. So if he decides he wants to start getting different measurements from either this AZV device or some other device, um, he can change the type of measurement. And then whatever units you want the measurement to be in and how often you want it to sample, uh, so five times a second. And uh, before we continue, just something that I thought to, to program in in this initial product was if you don't have all the fields entered and you hit start data collection, what happens? And this will tell you which fields aren't uh, populated and it will ask you to populate them before you try to start. And then, uh, the last input that I thought to have was a, a background duration, so basically collecting background data to zero the voltages before they're converted to loads. Um, we'll just do five seconds here. And then you can do the, uh, the output of the file name. We'll just call that PyOhio demo. And then we can start our data collection. And it'll tell you that it's gathering five seconds background data and then there's the plot in real time so you might recall that I put down uh, sampling five times a second this plots only updating every second so that's the reason for that is because I found if you got uh, over two two times a second with the plot update it became difficult to read because it was updating the plot so much so that's something else that I have to that's on my laundry list of things to to look into of how I can maintain a fixed plot and still have it updated, whatever the sampling frequency is. But it's lower on the priority list because uh, Kelly said it wasn't a big deal. So, <laughs> so if you look, uh, I can press down on the load cell and it'll go negative for compression and then I can pull on it and it goes positive. I think those numbers are off because I'm a lot stronger than that. <laughs> I'll have to look into that. <laughs> so then once you're done with your test, you can hit end data collection. It'll tell you the test is completed. Everything stops <clears throat> getting written to files and then you can come over here and select uh, the data file and it'll populate with the graph that was just streamed. And all these data files are stored in a specific directory. Yep, so just some upcoming improvements for the second version after I demoed this with Kelly uh, last week. 
and uh, he didn't request this, but this is just kind of a, a me thing that I think is important to do is anytime you reach a milestone to review your code and look at how it can be optimized, look at uh, whatever you've written down of, I hacked this together, but I could do it better. And then uh, things that we're gonna actually add to the dashboard include uh, an event marker uh, button that allows you to zero at multiple points throughout the test and a toggle switch for uh, switching the positive and negative on the data because when he uses this device, compression is actually typically what the loads are, the direction the loads are going in. Um, so you'd prefer that reads positive. And then a, uh, a separate tab that involves uh, a number of components that allows him to uh, calibrate sensors, calibrate the load cells. So some things that I've learned so far throughout this project is uh, it's very important to develop your objectives from the start. And you should keep in mind that uh, your audience doesn't really know, your, your audience may not know what they, what's out there. So really they don't know what they don't know. And if you can do a good job of providing them with details of certain tools that you're thinking about using, uh, and provide examples of the potential capabilities of these tools, things go a lot smoother and that helps spark ideas and the brainstorming starts. So. Um, and you want to kind of start simple uh, just to, to get going and hit the ground running. And it's important not to over promise too much. I put the too much there because I know uh, myself included will sometimes over promise to one, motivate yourself and two, challenge yourself. So. If you do overpromise too much, though, just make sure you keep uh, whoever your audience is or your end user is, just keep them, keep them in the loop with things. And if something needs to change, like let them know. And that goes to this point, which is you should communicate and uh, receive feedback often from whoever your end user is. And as I was saying, I took uh, a lot of notes throughout and they started with chicken scratch as I'm developing my code and everything, and I'd go back every now and then and organize them. And whenever I'd demo the product, I would get uh, ideas from, from Kelly and, and other people that he had with them, and I'd write those down and then eventually organize them and, and prioritize them. So you can uh, go after the low-hanging fruit first and then uh, focus on the, the more challenging or not as important uh, items later. And you should be sure to update your objectives uh, throughout your development, especially like during and after you demo with whoever your end user is. And uh, as you reach certain points, certain milestones, just take time to clean up your code because it can get pretty messy, as I'm sure all of you know. And most importantly, treat it as a learning experience. I found that that makes things uh, go a lot smoother you're unfamiliar with Dash and want to start uh, learning more about the tool, the Dash website's a great place to start. Their user guides have great examples of different components, very, very short snippets of code. Um, and they have the Dash app gallery, as I showed. And there's also a number of online tutorials. Uh, one of the ones that I found that to be very useful was one from uh, pythonprogramming.net. They have a five-part series that starts you off and then by the time you're done you're streaming live data on a number of plots. And with that, uh, thanks again for coming out and uh, we have time. Okay. Uh, we, we have some time for questions if anyone has questions. Um, I've been working on off and on on it because it's not uh, officially officially affiliated with my work, so it's kind of been a weekend project. I would say um, to become familiar enough with Dash to start writing uh, and actually know what you're writing instead of just copying tutorials, probably a weekend, and then uh, to get to that dashboard probably took uh, after 
learning about Dash and stuff probably took uh, maybe a week. So it's uh, fairly simple and straightforward, but like I said, as you go along, you realize, oh, I've been doing this incorrectly the entire time. Well, screw it, it works now. I'll fix it later. Kind of thing. So. Yeah. Uh, not yet, but we're. Uh, it's a lab jack. Uh, the load cells were uh, selected uh, by Kelly, and so they're just they're in line with the leg. Yeah. Have, have you talked at all to the manufacturer of the, the guide that the product uh, Yeah, so that's one of the things. That's uh, one of the reasons Kelly was so interested in, in doing something like this is because uh, the manufacturers don't really claim anything, but. Uh, people who have been using the product, they try to make these claims of they know exactly where the forces are, they know exactly what you can do with this, what you can't. And Kelly was really looking to have some hard data to back it up. Um, but in terms of the manufacturer, those three configurations that I showed, they show that those, can, those are potential configurations. But uh, firefighters are a very creative group of individuals. and. They will use a tool and find ways to use a tool until they break the tool, and then they'll find ways to use the broken pieces of the tool. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much.